الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فهو المختب ومن يذل فلن تجد له ولن يشد وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوضا عظيما All praise is due to Allah and after that all praise is due to Allah We thank him, we seek help from him, we ask guidance in him and we seek forgiveness in him from our own evils and from our own bad deeds Anyone who has been guided by Allah, they are indeed guided. And anyone who has been misguided by Allah, you will never find a guardian to guide them. I bear witness. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except for Allah, who is the only one without partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger to proceed forward. I don't know if everybody can see this, but I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way as this hashtag. So I wanted to start off uh, in this khutbah uh, with that. Um, but truly, um, we are living uh, in, in, in very wondrous times. And you wonder to yourself all the time, it's what's really going on in the world? You know, if you listened, you watched, you read, you did all of these things, uh, you would think that the bigotry, the racism, the sexism is limited to Islam and the Muslims. But uh, over the course of this year, uh, many different events have happened and you realize that it's not only restricted to the Muslim world as portrayed by the media but it's also occurring now in the West whether it be through Europe with, with, in Britain, UK and now with, the, uh, 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 with what's happening in the US nothing proves us more than what happened this week with the election of uh, Donald Trump as the next president of the United States um, you know, whether it be that incident, whether it be the massacres that are occurring in Syria, Iraq, the brutality that occurred in Palestine, the, uh, the plight of the, the Rohingya Muslims, you know, to the way the Muslims are treated now, and they will be probably in the West, um, in the world, it seems like, is coming down upon us. It seems like everything is, is, is going uh, haywire, if you want to call it. And so I don't know uh, about how you feel, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm getting very, very tired of it, I'm, I'm getting sick of it, and the more I read, the more sickening I become. It's like, a, it's like a depression. Not a clinical depression, but it's still something, a sadness, um, that you begin to, 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 to think about. And so, you know, when this happens, and now with social media the way it is, you know, instantly people all over the world know what probably, in the, you know, back in the body even a hundred years ago, you probably would have found out maybe about two or three weeks or two or three months later. And now everything is instantaneous. And so that adds to the anxiety and to the stress and to the conversation, all of these different types of things. So don't send me about an uh, no email about the dead people in Palestine. I already know that it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, the, 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 that's many uh, that's happening. And don't send me a picture of the little boy who, uh, who survived the bombing in, in, in Syria, because I know all of this is very, very, uh, and there's, there's, there's many of it, it's sickening, it's very horrific, uh, all of these things. And with this, all of this going around uh, around me, what I still you know, hold back to, uh, still have more anxiety about, is that feeling within my heart, that feeling within my heart that the worst is yet to come. The worst is yet to come. Meaning that we thought it was really bad after 9-11, we thought it was bad after one thing after another, it just keeps getting worse, and keeps getting worse and worse. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions in the hadith where in translation it says the nations are about to call each other and set upon you just as diners set upon food. Right? So it's like uh, the, all the nations are basically they're calling each other to a feast. And as you call people to the feast, you sit down, you have your meal, this meal in this day and age happens to be the Muslims. This is the, the feast that they're calling them to. And somebody asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, will it be because we are small in number, Ya Rasulullah. Is it because they are small in number? And the Prophet ﷺ said, rather, on that day you will be many. 
On that day you will be many, but you will be like the foam, like the foam on the river. And Allah will remove the fear, uh, fear of you from the hearts of your enemies and will throw uh, weakness into your heart, wahan into your heart. And so another, uh, um, uh, somebody said, um, what is this uh, weakness? You know, what is this wahan, Ya Rasulullah? What is this wahan? And the Prophet وسلم, he responded back and he said, Hubbu dunya wa kahil al-mawt. That the love of the dunya and the hatred of, the, of, of death. Hatred of death. And so that is the situation that we find ourselves in uh, uh, in, in this day and age. And I don't know many hadiths, right? You'll know, probably say this. But I'll be honest with you, as I am every single week whenever I get up here. And I told you earlier, I'm depressed. And there, I don't know what, what, what we can do. But <clears throat> I've spoken to many, many people and they feel the same kind of depression, the anxiety, all of these things. Many people are facing, especially this week. All the, the, the biggest top, topic of conversation is about what happened in America with the election of Donald Trump. But <clears throat> as I was reflecting upon this and I thought about what I wanted to speak about in my khutbah today, I came across one hadith that actually kind of made me feel a little bit better. Right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. And so the Prophet ﷺ, on the authority of Abdullah bin Abbas, he said that one day I was behind the Prophet ﷺ and he said to me, he said, young man, I shall teach you some words of advice. I shall teach you some words of advice. And the Prophet ﷺ told Abdullah bin Abbas, he said, be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. Be mindful of Allah and you will find Allah in front of you. <clears throat> if you ask, ask of Allah. If you seek help, seek help of Allah. Know that if a nation were to gather to benefit you with anything, it would only benefit you with something that Allah had already prescribed for you. And if the nation were to gather together to harm you with anything, they would only harm you with something that Allah had already uh, prescribed for you. The pens have been lifted and the pages have been dried. The pens have been lifted and the pages have been dried. Now like yourself, I, you know, you've probably, like I've heard this hadith many times. But certain times when you read something, it, it kind of it makes more of a relevance to you, it hits you more. And so, and that's what it did to me when, when I read it that day. And it gave me, uh, you know, a new understanding of what was really going on around us. So what I'd like to do with the rest of this khutbah is to be able to give you my understanding of this hadith. So in my opinion, this, this the way that, that, that this hadith helped me was that I had to read it backwards. Meaning take the last point first and then move my way up to the very beginning of the hadith. And so the, the very last thing the Prophet ﷺ told Abdullah bin Abbas was the pens have been lifted and the pages have been dried. Right? And so everything that's happening right now, <clears throat> it's already history. It's already happened. I mean, it's, it's already done. It's a done deal. Everything is, 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 is the way it is. The future is already written for us. <clears throat> Allah knows, but we don't know. Right? I don't know what my step, next step is going to be. I don't know the future of what the Muslims is going to be in the world, what we're going to face, what kind of hardships, sorrow, sadness, happiness, whatever it is that's there. I don't know what it's going to be. <clears throat> but I take comfort in the fact that Allah knows and it's already been, it's, it's already historical for, it, for, for Allah. It's already been written and not only has it been written, but the pages have been dry, meaning that it's already been done a while back. When? In the Lord of so this is something that you have to take comfort in. Now, a, a, a non-believer <coughs> will look at this and, and, and this part of it and say, well, if already it's been written and the pages have been dried and the pens have been lifted, then why even do anything? You see? But a mu'min, mu'min will take this as an instruction to say, whatever you do, whatever good that you do is good for you and don't worry about anything else. Let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of the, grand, the bigger picture. You just do your part in whatever it is you have to do. You do your part and Allah SWT will take care of this. That's what a mu'min thinks about this ayah. But if you have some doubt, you would say, well, what's the point? 
What's the point of doing anything because the pens have been lifted and the pages have been dried? So we have to be of those people of the moments who say that because this has already been written for us, we're going to do our best for whatever is out there and then don't worry about the rest. Don't worry about anything else that's out there. We're going to take care of ourselves, our families, our communities, our nation, and then our ummah. This is our responsibility. Then, before that, the Prophet says, Know that if a nation were to gather together to benefit you with anything, it would benefit you only with something that Allah had already prescribed for you. And if they gather together to harm you with anything, they would harm you only with something that Allah had already prescribed for you. It's very similar to the last point that I mentioned, where the, where the Prophet said, The pens have been lifted and the pages have been dried. So the next time I hear something on the radio, I watch something on television, I read something in the newspaper about the Muslims, I'm going to feel at ease. Because I know there's a greater power in control. Right? If I can't control it, I'm not going to worry about it. Because Allah SWT will. I will do my part. I will make dua for the people. I will give as much in sadaqah as I can. I can do whatever I can. But at the end of the day, I have to be able to feel at ease. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. And this is what this part of the ayah is saying. That no matter what anybody does, good, no matter what anybody does that's bad, not one iota, one atom more is going to happen to you, one atom less is going to happen to you, than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already prescribed for us. Not one atom. Now one thing that's going to happen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already said that is going to happen, that is written down, and the pages have been uh, 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 dried from it. So this should be, as moments, we should believe that this is going to be something that's, that's going to put us at ease. We shouldn't lose hope, and none of us should lose hope. None of us should lose hope, because no one can harm us with something greater than Allah has already prescribed for us. And the professor, uh, Dr. Sharon Jackson, he, he said, the reason why we despair is because we forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge. This is why we despair. Because we forget who is in charge. We think we are the masters of our own affairs. We think Donald Trump is the one who is going to lead America in a certain direction. We think the politicians of Malaysia or in Iran or in Iraq or anywhere else in the world, they are the ones in control. They are not in control. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. And that should they make us not feel despair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, what he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asrafu ala anfusihim la taqannatu min rahmatillah. He says, oh, it say, O oh Prophet, those who have transgressed their souls, right, do not despair the mercy of Allah. That Allah Ta'ala will forgive all of your sins. That He is the one who is all forgiving, most merciful. Now, what is the condition for this? That turn to your Lord and submit to Him. This is our condition. That when we, it's not only enough that we don't despair, but in times of desperation, in times when we feel like we want to be, uh, uh, and, and, uh, feel anxiety, feel anxious, feel saddened, not only do we not, not despair, but we turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And we turn towards Him and we follow Him. We submit to Him. That we turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we submit. To what? What are we submitting to? We submit it to the fact that the Prophet said that not one thing is going to happen to you unless you're already prescribed. Not a good thing is going to happen, not a bad thing is going to happen, unless Allah SWT has already said it's going to happen. And this should bring us um, to some eat. Now, in that case, it's an open ground. I'm going to speak freely, I'm going to speak the truth, I'm going to fight for oppression however I can, because no, not one person, not Netanyahu, not Daesh, not Assad, not Trump, no one can harm me or benefit me unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already written it for me. What do I have to lose? It's already been written for whatever it is that it's going to happen because no one can, can, can actually do that, right? And whatever does happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells me and tells us in the Quran that He will not place a burden on us greater than we have the strength to bear. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا Right? That Allah SWT will not put upon us burden that we can't handle. 
So whatever it is that whatever hardship we go through, we will be able to do that. I'm gonna just pause only for a second. It's raining outside, but as if anybody can scoot up, then whatever whoever is outside will be able to come and be away from the, the rain. So everybody just take one step if you can, just one forward if you can mind. Just like that. Okay. <clears throat> now comes the, the hard part. Because I know this is hard, right? We have it harder than the companions do. Uh, I was reading recently about the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, and I want to mention two things that, that, that struck out to me when I was reading about the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Uh, and that the, the first one has to do with after the treaty has already been signed. It's, it's very relevant in this day because it tells us the companions for, to a certain extent, had it easy, right? The, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ was, was writing back from the Treaty of Hud after signing the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, after sealing it, when he was writing back towards Medina, let, imagine the, the environment that was there. We had just come up from a situation where the Muslims were all excited about going for Umrah. All excited about going for Umrah, they weren't able to complete it, and then when they signed the treaty, everybody thought that this was a loss. All of the Muslims thought this is, this is a humiliation. And so when they're going back towards, towards Medina, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he gallops up to the Prophet And the Prophet he tells him, uh, he says, we have been victorious today. That's all he says. He says, we have been victorious today because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to me this, uh, the, 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 this ayah. And so without hesitation, Umar became happy. He became excited. He yelled out, Allahu Akbar. And then he started riding through the ranks of the, of the Muslims, telling them of the good news that we were victorious. And the entire mood of the, of the, of the, of the people, of the Muslims during that time, it completely changed. Why? Because of one ayah that was revealed, which was, Inna fatahna laka mubina. That verily uh, uh, we have given you this, this victory as a clear victory. And just from that, the Muslims were, were uh, uplifted and all of their sorrows, their, their sadness, whatever, it was taken away. Now the reason why it's hard for us now is because we don't have the Prophet ﷺ to console us. We don't have an ayah that comes down to us every time something like a Trump gets elected to president. That is very hard. That's why the Prophet ﷺ told us that the Muslims of future generations, it's going to be more difficult for them to become Muslim. And so we, we have this, this, this within us. But at the same time, right, at the same time, we have to, um, uh, we, we, because we don't have the wisdom of, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, um, we, uh, we are more like the situation uh, of the, during the time of the writing of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. This is our situation. I'm going to describe the situation to you because it's more relevant to us. Not the situation of something bad happens and all of a sudden there's an ayah that comes down to the Prophet and the Muslims get uplifted because we don't have that luxury anymore. And you know, we don't have the luxury. So what the situation for us happened during the time when the actual writing of the of the of the, of the tree of Hudaybiyah came, I write more like a situation when the Muslims felt defeated, Umar ibn Khattab, again this is Umar, he turned to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, aren't you truly the messenger or the apostle of Allah? And the Prophet said, yes. And then he, he said, then should, uh, and then he said, that isn't our cause, isn't our cause the just cause and one that, that and the enemy's cause is something that's unjust? And the Prophet said, yes. Yeah, Umar, this, this is the truth. And then Umar responded back and he said, that why should we be, we be humiliated in our religion? Why should we be put down in the religion? Because of this treaty. Now listen to the response of the Prophet <laughs> because this is very relevant to our situation today. The Prophet also responded back to Umar, he said, he said, yeah, but I am Allah's uh, apostle, I am Allah's messenger, and I do not disobey him. And he will make me victorious. That's all, he didn't know. The Prophet ﷺ at that time, that ayah of, of inna fatahna laka fatum rubina was not revealed. The Prophet was just as nervous, as, 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 as un, undetermined as the people, as the Muslims were. But he knew what his direction was and that was towards Allah SWT. He knew certain things. He knew he was, the, he was the messenger of Allah, right? And he knew without a shadow of a doubt that Allah would make him victorious. And he did whatever that he could. And in that situation, we have to, we have this in, in, our, in our situation. Now Allah SWT tells us certain things about the Muslim or the Ummah. He tells us we will be victorious. He doesn't tell us it will be in our time. 
So when Umar ibn Khattab told, uh, asked the Prophet Sallallahu didn't you promise that we would visit the Kaaba this year? Or didn't you promise that we would visit the Kaaba? And the Prophet responded back, Ya Umar, did I tell you it was going to be this year? And so the same way Allah SWT is telling us, we will be victorious. But what did he say that we were we going to be victorious in our lifetime? In the next lifetime, the lifetime before? Allah SWT doesn't mention that. All we have to do is move along this path, along this journey of becoming better Muslims. Allah SWT will take care of the rest. He said he will make us victorious and that the promise of Allah is true. He will have it. We have to take comfort in that. And then move on with, with our with our uh, um, with, with our business of, of worshiping him, asking him, and doing all of these things. Then in the same hadith going back, the Prophet said, if you ask, ask Allah. If you seek help, seek help of Allah. If you ask, ask of Allah. If you seek help, seek help of Allah. Because we can have our friendships, our treaties, um, our alliances, all of these things are not what this hadith is telling us not to do. We can do all of that, but at the end of the day, we have to turn back to Allah SWT and we have to ask Him for help. We have to turn back to Allah SWT and we have to ask Him for guidance. This is um, um, something that we, that's our responsibility. We do whatever we can in this world, but at the end of the day, we know that the one in control is not us. The one in control is not our, the person that, we're, that is opposing us. The one in control is not our leaders. The one in control is Allah SWT. So who do you want to ask for help? Do you want to ask the person or the, 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 the being that is in control of everything? Or do you want to have ask somebody who has nothing, maybe, uh, maybe you know, 50, 60, 70 years of his life left and that's it. And then, and, and then we're done. And there are brothers, there's still people standing outside. So again, I'll ask you, there's also some places up here. If people from the back want to come up front, inshallah. And so we should ask. Allah SWT for whatever it is that we want and it is a right that Allah SWT has bestowed upon us as, 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 as believers, right? That, and then Allah SWT even taught us if through our, our beloved Messenger وسلم, exactly how to ask. Because the Prophet وسلم, said, when, you, when one of you prays, let him not say, Oh Allah, forgive me, if that is your wish. That is not how a woman asks Allah SWT. The Prophet also, but let him be firm in conviction and cherish a great hope. And Allah does not consider anything too great for him to be able to grant. Right? So Allah SWT says, uh, in this, in this uh, the Prophet also said um, that whenever you ask, you ask with conviction, you ask with hope, and you know that whatever you ask for in this world, it is nothing that Allah SWT cannot answer it because nothing is too great for Allah SWT to be able to grant you. And so from now on, as we make supplication for the suffering of Muslims, let us pray to Allah SWT with conviction and with hope that He deliver us out of these trying times successfully and being even better Muslims than we were when we came into the situation in the first place. And lastly, whatever we do, we must always be mindful of Allah whenever we have a decision to make between right and wrong, we must be mindful of Allah SWT. When people persecute us, they laugh at us, they ridicule us, they mock us, they do whatever it is. If we are mindful of Allah, if we have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we will always be taking the moral high ground. We will not stoop to their level of bigotry, of racism, of sexism, of any ism that is bad. We will not stoop to their level, but we will rise to the level of being true believers in Allah SWT, knowing that if we do the right thing, we are mindful of Allah, knowing that if we do the right thing, um, that we have to do the right thing because Allah SWT has prescribed all of this for us, and we do the right thing because Allah SWT is in control. It is not us who are in control, it is Allah SWT uh, that, that will do that. Because the Prophet said, be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. So you want protection from Allah from everything? Have taqwa of Allah. Have, be mindful of Allah. If you want Allah SWT to be able to, uh, when you find yourself being vulnerable without protection, who do we turn to? We turn to Allah SWT. We are mindful of Allah, for if we are, then you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of you. That is what the Prophet said. That if you are mindful of Allah, then you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
in front of me. أقول قولي هذا وسفنا وليكم وسفنا. الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So brothers, you know we're going through these difficult times, and people are really, you know, anxious, nervous about what is happening all around us. This is one of in our generation, in our era. This is one of the greatest tests that we have as as Muslims living in this world today. But imagine for yourself, I mean, whatever it is that you're facing, there's always a Muslim that's worse than you are. I was thinking about this uh, with with somebody, and I said to myself. <coughs> I said, I have to explain to my children how the world will be, because they're American citizens, how the world will be in the era of Trump. But then I thought to myself and said, you know, there's people, there's Muslims in the world that I have to explain to their children that they're living in the time of, of Assad. That they don't have to explain how they're going to be in America, they have to explain why their houses are being bombed. This is a completely different situation. And we have to realize that even with all of the trials and tribulations that we have, that we are blessed as a community. <clears throat> that we are blessed, even living here in Malaysia, we are blessed as a community. And there are so many more people are saving so many hardships that we can't even imagine um, them um, to be able to have. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says <clears throat> that He tests us to see which of us is the best in deeds. In Surah Al-Mulk, He actually says that. That he will test you to find out which of you is the best in these. And nothing comes without hard work and a struggle, not even Jannah. And this is something we always have to realize. That not even Jannah will come, paradise, will come without hard work and sacrifice. But many times we forget about this. We forget that we have to struggle through this. In Surah Al-Kabut, Allah SWT begins that Surah in translation and He says, do the people not think that they will be left to say, uh, we believe, and then they will not be tried? This is Allah that asked me a rhetorical question. And then he goes on in the next side and says, but we have certainly tried those before them, and Allah will surely make evident those who are truthful, and He will surely make evident those who are liars. Meaning that basically this test is like a, it's like a, 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 a one of those things, it's like a, a drainer. Right? All the Muslims are put into this drain and only the few that, that survive are going to be the ones that truly are believers in Allah SWT. So what Allah SWT is saying is when you're put through these tests, you're being, being done that, it's an imtihan, it's an exam. And just like when you're in school, you have exams and you find out who passes and who fails, this is no different. This is no different for us. This is an imtihan, this is a, a test for us to figure out which one of us is going to be the best in deeds. Which one of us, Allah SWT says, is going to be the one who is truthful? Truthful in what? Truthful in saying, La ilaha illallah. Which of us is the one who is going to be truthful in saying, La ilaha illallah? And which one of us is going to be the one who Allah SWT says is the one who is a liar? This is the test that Allah SWT will put towards us. When you see a diamond, you marvel at the beauty of that diamond. But no, many people don't realize how much heat pressure, years and thousands of years that that rock had to go through to become that beautiful diamond. And in the same way, when we see scholars and we see knowledgeable people, we only look at their knowledge and their actions and those type of things. We forget that they had to go through toil and turmoil to be able to get to that level that they're at. And what we want to do is we want to become that diamond without that pressure. We want to become that diamond without that heat, and it's not possible. There's no diamond created on this earth that doesn't go through that pressure. And so for you, as a human being, to become that elevated person that is mindful of Allah SWT, that is always making the of Allah SWT, there is no way you get to that state without Allah SWT testing us. Without Allah SWT testing me, testing you, testing this ummah to figure out which of us is going to be truthful uh, in, in, in this area. And so, you know, we have to uh, uh, face it that, uh, that people in this world are getting ahead of us because we've slacked off. We've lost, for the most part, our religion. We've lost our deen. We've lost our drive to do something better. The majority of the Muslim world has actually done that. We spend time at work 
right? Uh, uh, when, uh, when, 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 when we have to be able to have time for us to spend time at work, and we have the time to be able to spend towards something to do with Islam. That something to do with Islam is as a community, as a family, and even as individuals, we have to do something. Because there's no time left, and we have to do this now. For those people who thought that, you know, after 9-11, after the terrorist attack then, that that was the end, and let other people go out there and, and, and fight for the Muslims, now you realize that it's become even worse. And so more people need to rise up and do that. And before it's too late, we need every single person in this ummah to be able to do something towards making this world a better place towards Muslims. It's not easy. I know we have families, we have work, we have friends, but during these days of hardship, we have to figure out our priorities. We have to know what is what is really uh, 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 something that we have to focus on and not for folks now. Because one day, history will be writing about us as Muslims living in this era. A hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, when they, when history historians write, they're going to look back at this era and they're going to ask, what did the Muslims in this era do? Now, alhamdulillah, we look in, this, in Malaysia, we look at our forefathers and we say, how is it, mashallah, they did so much to be able to get Malaysia to this state that they are in today. How many post-colonial, British-dominated uh, countries do you see that are at the level that Malaysia is at? Be honest, there's none. And so our forefathers did the job that they were supposed to, to elevate the status of the Muslims. But now that is done, we don't look back, we look forward and say, what is it that we can do? What is it that we can do as individuals to move that from, from here to the next level? What is it that we can do that move from us from here to that next level of being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Of being true believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? Because now we have the luxury of being able to do that. We have our good jobs, we have our good money, we have our good everything, and we can sit back and we can be what are called you know, armchair coaches, and do nothing but just complain, or comment on what everybody else is doing, or we can actually do something about it on an individual level. Because even right now this is happening. And now, mashallah, the country has beautiful masajid that people can be proud of. I know I have visitors from the United States and all over the world coming here all the time, and they marvel at the beauty of Malaysia, and especially the masajid that are there. And so one thing, the question you have to ask yourself is, right, in the next generation or so, are these masajid going to be of those that are empty and just for tourists? Or are they going to be, when the tourists come, they are going to be filled and there's no space for the tourists to enter because all of the Muslims are there paying, praying their, their prayers, their fajr, their duhar, their asr, their maghrib, their nisha, and all of the different types of things. And whether we will say, um, stay in Muslim in form or elevate ourselves to become mu'min and eventually muhsin. And eventually muhsin. This is our challenge, brothers, today in this day and era with all the things that are happening around us. This is our challenge. This is our responsibility. We need to individually take up that challenge and responsibility and say, what is it I, as an individual, can do to be able to better the, the state of the Muslim Ummah? What is it that I individually can do? And that, that, that answer should always start with rectifying yourself. But it doesn't stop there. It starts with rectifying yourself, but then it moves forward to rectifying your family, rectifying your neighborhood, your community, and eventually, if everybody does that, then the Ummah, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us for, for being able to be the best of generations brought out of mankind. Rabbana <laughs> atina